Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for watching this video today. This message is about baptism. We are baptizing people in our church. We're gonna talk about what it means to be baptized, why this is so important, and why it's such a beautiful celebration that we take part of as the church. What you're watching right now is just the message. If you wanna watch the baptisms themselves, the live stream is up from February 6th. And so go there and check out what we got to celebrate this day. And if you have any questions, go ahead and text the number at the bottom of the screen. We love you guys. Good morning, church. Happy Baptism Sunday. Excited to be here? All right. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk about something that might be a little bit out of the ordinary, something that, depending on your background, depending on your experience, it might be somewhat uh, unfamiliar or uncomfortable. But what I want to talk about today, I think, is necessary in order for us as a church to understand the depths of joy that we celebrate today as we baptize Reed and Alex Tucker, Bob Shoemaker, Megan Snoke, Jake Stone, Amanda and Landon Green, Sarah Henley, and Cassie Whittington in the name of Jesus Christ. And so today, on Baptism Sunday of all days, I'm gonna talk a little bit about spiritual warfare. All right? Uh, this is a big topic. This is a strange topic. I have about 25 minutes, and so I'm not gonna answer all of our questions. I'm not gonna be able to dive into everything that has to do with this big topic. And so if you leave here today, and you have questions that are unanswered, or you have things that got stirred up from this conversation, uh, the one thing that I want you to know is that my door is always open. Uh, my library is yours. I will give you any book that you want, and I will have any conversation with you that you want. But today, I think we at least have to broach the topic before we do baptisms. According to the scriptures and made explicit by the Apostle Paul in that reading that we just read together, we as Christians in a fallen world, we find ourselves in the midst of a struggle. We find ourselves in the midst of a battle and we find ourselves at war. And the war that we find ourselves in is not a conventional war that you and I understand. This is not a battle against flesh and blood. This is not a battle against other humans. This is a battle against something much deeper, something much darker, and something much more sinister. Our struggle, according to Paul, and I believe according to Jesus, is a struggle against the rulers and the authorities of a different realm. It's a struggle, it is a battle against the powers of darkness, and the spiritual forces of evil. Fleming Rutledge says this about the Christian reality. Jesus Christ has come. Jesus Christ will come. We do not know the day or the hour. And if you find this tension almost unbearable at times, then you understand the Christian life. We live at what the New Testament depicts as the turn of the ages. In Jesus, the kingdom of God is on a head-on collision with the powers of darkness, and the point of impact is the place where Christians take their stand. That is why it hurts. That is why the church has to take a beating. This is what scripture tells us. No wonder there's so many who fall away. The church is located precisely where the battle line is drawn. For those of us who take on his holy name, for those of us who take on the immense privilege of claiming to be Christians, a call is placed upon our life. And part of the call of the Christian life is to step into that struggle, in that battle, to put on the armor of God and to stand our ground, to plant both of our feet firmly onto the contested land and with soft hearts and steel spines to stand firm to not give an inch, to stand our ground. And what I wanna to argue today, and what I believe we are here today celebrating is that not only are we called to stand our ground, but from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself in this battle, in this struggle, in this world, we as the church are called to take ground. And today, in the waters of baptism, we take ground. Amen? Amen. The Great Commission. Some of us might be familiar with this. The Great Commission is in Matthew chapter 28, and it is supposed to be the form that the Christian life takes. I had a seminary professor who told me, he said, I wanna make sure that you guys in this class understand this because you're gonna be teaching this to, to people 
The Great Commission is not the great suggestion. It's not the great idea, and it's not the great possibility. It is the command that the one that we claim to worship gave his church. It is supposed to be what our life looks like. And so it's important for us to take this, to internalize it, and to understand what it means. Let me set the context. The end of the the book of Matthew, uh, what we as Christians believe is that God has become flesh and blood and he has walked amongst us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, Not only has he walked amongst us, been with us, Emmanuel, but Jesus had made certain claims about himself. And his main claim was that he was the king, the true king, the king of Israel, and therefore the king of the world. And that means that this is his kingdom. He announced this in his life and in his ministry on the cross. He faced down the powers of darkness and evil and sin and death. And in his resurrection, he has risen triumphantly over them. And in a moment, he's going to ascend to the right hand of the Father, which is when he takes his throne, his rightful place on the throne as the living Lord of the cosmos, of creation. And before he takes his throne, before he goes, he looks at his disciples, he looks at his followers, he looks at the church, and this is what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Great Commission. This is the marching orders for the church. The first sentence of this commandment is oftentimes the part that that we neglect in our teaching and our preaching, But I believe that it is in that first sentence that the rest of the action and the rest of the commission comes from. If that first sentence isn't true, then the commission is meaningless. He says, all authority, the Greek word for authority is exousia. It's where the word exercise comes from. When you exercise your body, you have authority over your body. If you exercise a demon, you you have authority over that demon. So all exousia, all authority, both in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Why? Because he's the king. So he's the king. This is his kingdom. This is his world. This world belongs to him. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to the one that we call the Christ. Why does he have to say that to his church before he tells them what they're supposed to do, before they go back out into the world? Well, because they're going out into the same world that you and I go out into. And the world that you and I go out into every day is a world that sometimes feels like maybe some other power is in charge. Like maybe some other force is actually in charge. Maybe the darkness is gaining ground and the light is receding. Maybe it's the evil that's taking ground. And maybe the goodness is falling away. You ever feel this? You ever feel this evil? You ever feel the pressure? Does it ever feel sometimes like every day there's some kind of battle that's being waged for your soul? You know, we don't like this kind of language about spirits and other realms, but when you look around, it's it's difficult to deny that these things exist. You know, you look at the world, and there is like big, structural, obvious evil in this world. You know, you look at things like human trafficking, the amount of people that are stuck and trapped in slavery today is astounding. You look at something like child abuse that happens all over the world, all kinds. You know, these are big issues. We have a a system of, of greed that has become so normalized that it works its way into every part of our life. It's hard to separate from that, even if you want to. We see these things. You know, we see this big, obvious evil. We know what it is. We call it what it is. We believe that that's evil. And as Christians, we do believe in some way that that is the action or at least the fruit of the action of the forces that are opposed to the kingdom of God. That is not how the world is supposed to be. So how does it get like that? because there's oppositional forces, and there's this fruit, this bad fruit that is born from these forces of evil. 
But not all evil's big and obvious. The forces of darkness do not strictly work on those big, obvious, name it and claim it type ways. These forces are at work in our lives all the time, whether we know it or not. And a lot of times, the way that this happens and the way that we experience this, it doesn't feel super sinister. It feels normal. It feels like this is just the way that the world is. You know, one thing that we have to remember if we're gonna take this topic seriously is we have to remember what the mission and what the goal of the forces that are opposed to God is. It's a simple mission. The mission is to take us and to take our attention and our worship and our love away from Jesus and to give it to anything else. You know, they don't even demand that we worship them specifically, they just demand that we don't worship him. And the way this works, it doesn't always feel obvious, but, but the, the destruction that it manifests in our life does become obvious. And the reason is because of who we are. You know, if you are a human being, which I'm assuming most of us in this room are, you were created for God. You were created to be in intimate union with him. We were created to be intimately connected with God. And so in any way that we find ourselves disconnected, in any way that we find ourselves alienated, in any separation that, that exists in our life between us and God, we are not free and we are not as we ought to be. And more than just being created for God, our, our life was created to be given to God. We were created to live for God. That's what the last three weeks called Why Look at the Sky was all about. What were you created for as an image of God? You were created to live for him. And so anytime we live for something else, anytime we give ourselves to something or someone other than God, we are not free. And we are not who we ought to be. The darkness wins when it turns us from Jesus, and the end of turning from Jesus is some sort of destruction. It's some sort of frustrated life that promises us the world, takes our soul, and gives us nothing in return. I know this is heavy, but you think about your life, and you think about the lives of people around you, and we can kind of like intuitively know that there's something active at work. You know, we have these sin patterns, these thought patterns in our life. We want to escape them, and it feels like we can't escape them. Why can't we escape them? We believe these lies about ourselves that we kind of deep down know aren't true, but we can't stop believing them, and worse than that, we can't stop living them. Why can't we stop? You know, you take a job, and you know it's gonna be good for you and your family, that's why you took it, and here you are. 10 years later, and the job has taken you, it's consumed you, it's fractured your relationships, and it's made you compromise your convictions, and it's like, how did that happen? How did we get here? How did it take on a life of its own? How has it pushed me so far from Jesus? It's almost like there's an animating force behind it. You know, we don't have good modern language for this. But Paul did, and Jesus did. They called these things the forces of darkness. And they're at work. And so you go back to the Great Commission, that first line. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Yeah, these forces exist. Yeah, I'm sending you into battle. Yeah, I'm sending you into the struggle. And it's not going to be easy because these forces, these powers, they have agency. They move. They're at work, but guess what? This world does not belong to them anymore. This world is mine because I am the king. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then there's this weird transition where he says, therefore, because of that, now you go take ground. 
Because all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, now you go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to live like me, walk forever in my presence, go build for the kingdom. It's almost like the exousia, the authority that's been given to Jesus has been transferred to his church. It's almost like in this age, in this moment, until Christ comes back, the mantle has been passed to us. If the kingdom's gonna be built for, if the forces are gonna be fought, it is through the church that they're fought. The authority of the king has been delegated to his church. John chapter one, the prologue of the Gospel of John, he says this, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. To those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, his church, he gave them the right to become children of God. That word that we translate into the English as right, guess what word that is in Greek? Guess. Exousia. To those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the authority to become the children of God because there's a battle and there's ground to be taken. He is the king. He has given us the authority. The authority that belongs to the king has been given to those who belong to the king. This world is his and there's ground to be taken. You think about what we just talked about a moment ago with the darkness and it's either this big darkness this big evil that's obvious, but it's so big that we don't even know where to start. Or it's so subtle in our lives just trying to turn us from Jesus that it's like we don't even know if it's there. Sometimes we don't even notice it. And you see that, and it's easy to look at that and be like, who can fight against these forces? Who can take that battle? Who can step into that arena against those things and win? Jesus answers the question in his great commission. You know what he says? You can. You can. The church, my people, my followers, you can go into this battle and you can take ground in my name. In fact, you must. That's his commission. That's his command. That's what the church is supposed to look like. And so if the battle lines are drawn, and this is our reality, then we have to choose a side. C.S. Lewis says there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Enemy-occupied territory, that is what this world is. And so if that's true, and we live on contested ground, where the ground is contested, you have to pick a side. One thing, that your life will not be as neutral. It's a big mistake that we make in this world. We think that maybe we can just exist. It's not true. You will use your talents and your treasures and your gifts and your abilities and everything that God has put upon your life and you will fight for something. You will take ground for someone. Who will we fight for? Who will we battle for? To whom will we give our allegiance to? Why we celebrate days like today is because baptism is a moment where we declare our allegiance to Jesus. We dramatically act out in the waters who we are. We are his, we are in Christ. And so we go under the water and we die with him. We're buried with him on the cross. And we come out of the waters and we're raised to new life and bathed in the light of the resurrection, we go out into the world and we fight the battle. And we go on the grind. This is who we are now. We are in Christ. We are incorporated into Christ. He is with us. What's true of him is true of us. This is who we are now. We're bound to him, we're marked by him, we're claimed by him, and we come out of the waters and we believe that we are who Jesus says that we are. Saved, forgiven, loved, renewed, empowered, and commissioned. This is what spiritual warfare looks like, by the way. 
Horror movies have given us some crazy ideas of what spiritual warfare, this is what it looks like. It looks like the Great Commission. Spiritual warfare looks like the Great Commission. It looks like baptism. And so today, we party. As our brothers and sisters get baptized today, we celebrate victory in the battle in the beginning of lives that are dedicated and consecrated to Jesus Christ. Fleming Rutledge, again, she's a very smart woman. She says, every baptism is a victory over death. And so we sing and we cry and we yell and we cheer because yeah, you're gonna go into a struggle. You're gonna go out into a world that is not easy, that has all of these things that we're talking about, but this is a moment of victory because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And we then, his church, his children, are called to build in his name, and today we build, and these are living stones. And so how the rest of your life fights against the powers of darkness is a big, complicated topic called discipleship, and you will spend your whole life in Christian community trying to figure out exactly what this looks like and how this works. This is what we talk about every Sunday. This is what we talk about in our small groups. This is what we talk about in our classes. How does this actually work? What does this look like? What do we do? What don't we do? I'll I'll, I'll summarize it using the theming that Paul said at the beginning. It has something to do with remembering whose world this is and whose it is not, the belt of truth. It has something to do with making the hard choice to follow Jesus over and over and over again every day, even though renouncing the things of this world might make the world hate you. The breastplate of righteousness. It has to do with fighting by the means of the Great Commission in peace and in love, the gospel of peace. It has to do with remembering that when the attacks come, that your deepest well-being is in the heart of God and that you can trust him no matter what the circumstances look like, the shield of faith. And it has to do with remembering who you are. You are saved, which means you are chosen, which means you are chosen for this mission, you right now, your world, where you're going. And so he believes in you, the helmet of salvation. And it has to do with being filled by the empowering presence of the same spirit that rolled the stone away and raised Christ from the dead the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. It has to do with all of these things, and we talk about these things a lot, but today I don't want to talk about them in detail because I don't want to take away from this moment. This moment today marks the beginning. We pledge our allegiance to Christ. We renounce our allegiance to all the other entities, and you come out of that water, and you've chosen your side. And that is beautiful. And so let me end with this, okay? Because this is perhaps somewhat of a new topic that I just kind of dropped like a bomb in like a 20 minute message. It can feel scary to think that this is the world that we live in, to, to think that that's actually happening to us, to think that those forces are at work. And so what I wanna leave you guys with as you leave the waters and go back out into the world and every Christian in here who claims the name of Jesus as you go back out into the world is remember who you are. Remember who you are, remember whose you are. You belong to the king. You belong to the one who has all of the authority. All of these forces, this darkness that we're talking about, these forces encountered Jesus when he was living. There's stories about it. In Matthew chapter nine, Jesus comes into uh, like a graveyard, you know, where they kept the tombs. And there's two men who have been possessed by these evil forces for years. And they've become so violent that people won't even walk through this place anymore. They go around it because they're scared of these men. Jesus approaches these men and the forces, they see him. And you know what they say? They say, what do you want with us, son of God? Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? They know who he is. You know, his disciples don't really know who he is in this moment. The people who reject him do not know who he is, but the forces of evil and darkness, they know who he is and they're terrified. They know they don't have a chance. They know their time is running short. 
They know that his is the authority. They know who he is. You belong to him now. You are his, you're marked by him. His spirit is in you. They know who he is, and so they know who you are. Remember who you are. There's nothing to fear when we are Christ's, and we are Christ's. What beautiful grace we have been given by our Savior to participate in taking ground today. We are proud of you. We believe in you, we are excited for you, and we are here for you forever in this mission that you're walking into right now. May the power and the grace of God be with you in this moment. May the spirit that rolled the stone away and raised Christ from the dead form you into his disciple. And may you go out into the world empowered and commissioned. And may you take ground in the name of Jesus. Amen? You guys ready? You guys ready? Let's go. Hey everybody, thanks for watching today. If you have questions, uh, need more information, wanna get connected, have prayer requests, or just need somebody to talk to, you can text the number on the screen. We love you guys. Thanks for watching and we'll see you later.